Jeff Zwerink here and welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific discoveries and how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined by president and founder of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to be discussing one of the latest exoplanet finds, something that's being hailed as another Earth. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Jeff. So there's been a discovery of this planet called Kepler-1649c. Uh, why don't you give us some of the details? Because this is being hailed as a planet that uh, is habitable almost, that we could go live. And so kind of tell us some of the details so we know what we're talking about here. Well, they're saying it's the most Earth-like planet that's been discovered outside the solar system to date. Most Earth-like in that it both matches roughly uh, the temperature uh, and the size of the planet. There are planets that are closer in size and closer in temperature, but this has kind of got that combination. Well, so give us some of the details on the size. I mean, compared to Earth, what's its diameter? What's its mass? Uh, are there other planets in the system? Well, there are other planets in the system, and uh, its diameter is about 6% greater than we see on planet Earth, so it's a little bit bigger. And it receives 74% as much light and heat uh, from its star as Earth recedes from the sun. Okay, so, so I'm gonna loop back to the 75% there, but I, I do know that part of what's interesting about this planet is that it's got a habitable zone around its star that is much closer. So that means that it's an M dwarf star. What sort of implications does that have for habitable planets? That's a good point, Jeff, because this star has uh, only one half percent the luminosity of our star, the sun. So yeah, this is a planet. So yeah, so go let's ahead. Take that. One half of a percent. So, uh, you know, about uh, what's that? A hundred times dimmer. Two hundred times dimmer. Two hundred times dimmer. Very good. Okay, can continue on. Kind of what is it, what are the implications of that? That means star? that uh, we're you know, for it to be in the water, liquid water habitable zone, it's orbiting its star very closely, so close that it's very likely that it's tidally locked which means you got one side of the planet facing the star all the time. The other side never faces it. So you got one side that's extremely cold, the other side that is extremely hot. And, and then you got this twilight zone uh, right on the edge of daylight and darkness. But the problem there is any water on the warm side is going to be transported to the cold side and become permanently frozen. And moreover, when you're that close, you're going to be blasted by the ultraviolet radiation from the star. So, so we've got a scenario around this. So an M dwarf star is a star that's much smaller. So this planet, I think it orbits like once every 20 days, uh, yes. which even Mercury is something on the order of 88 days. So this is well inside the orbit of Mercury. Um, and it's tidally locked, which, uh, you know, mean, like, like the moon, the same side of the moon always faces the Earth. So the same side of this planet will always face the star, correct? That's correct. And moreover, being a very tiny M dwarf star, it's going to be throwing out super flares and super flares are deadly for life. So what it, I mean, that, that's a little counterintuitive. What is it about these stars since they're smaller than the sun? Why do they give off so much more of this harmful radiation? It seemed like you'd have to be a more massive star to do that. Well, uh, the smaller the star and also it's true, the larger the star, the more variable the star. Our star, the sun, has precisely the mass where you got the maximum luminosity stability. So as you move away from the mass of the sun, you're dealing with stars that are more variable and more likely to throw out uh, these deadly flares. The flares are going to be more frequent and they're going to be much more intense than we get here on Earth. So these are the types of events where they're going to throw off uh, a lot of cosmic rays or, or uh, you know, coronal mass ejections or, or flares where things are gonna go impinge on the planet. Uh, you know, we had one of these happen back in the 1800s, which actually, uh, you know, powered transatlantic telegraphs with, without being plugged into batteries. So enormous amounts of energy being dumped onto the surface of this, of this planet simply because the star is gonna be doing this, correct? A lot, correct? correct. And moreover, the planet's a lot closer, so it's gonna take a bigger hit. Gotcha, very good. So, so you had mentioned that this planet is receiving about 74, 75% of the light that the Earth receives from the sun. That would seem, I mean, you know, we're talking about global warming, global cooling, we're talking about 1% changes. How could it be that much less radiation that it receives and still being talked about as being habitable? Well, it all depends on the atmosphere. If you've got enough greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it'll trap more heat from the host star. 
For example, take away all the greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere, the global mean temperature would be 18 degrees uh, below zero. Uh, but because of the green, yeah, it's a little chilly. Thanks to the greenhouse gases, it's a nice balmy 17 degrees centigrade uh, on average. And so what they're saying about this planet is that maybe it's got a whole lot more greenhouse gases than the Earth, in which case liquid water can, could conceivably exist on its surface. Well, okay, so, but when we look at Earth, we do see that obviously there's a lot of greenhouse heating going on, but we're talking about small changes in the amount of carbon dioxide having huge ramifications for the habitability here on Earth. And we know that Earth's atmosphere has changed a lot. So how, it would seem to make that detriment, or that would seem to be a very negative consequence for this star genuinely being, or this planet being habitable. Well, it would certainly rule out life like ourselves or even animals, because in order to get the greenhouse gases up enough to trap enough heat from the star, lungs aren't going to be able to function. I mean, if we were to increase the carbon dioxide by about a factor of three, we'd be in trouble. Explain a little bit of why that is. Are we talking about just an increase in atmospheric pressure? Or are we talking about just having more carbon dioxide that we would be breathing? Well, more carbon dioxide is toxic. Like if we get up to say 900 parts uh, per million, the carbon dioxide you breathe would actually start damaging your organs. But there's also the air pressure problem. If you're gonna increase the air pressure, that's more work for your lungs. And our lungs can only tolerate about a factor of three times more air pressure. So there's two reasons why you don't wanna load up the atmosphere with more carbon dioxide. So kind of explain, if you will, a little bit of what's going on in our solar system. Because I know this, our sun has, uh, was much dimmer in the past and it's gotten much brighter. And so that's, in order for Earth to be habitable, there's had to be this kind of commensurate change in atmospheric gases. How has that worked on Earth or in our solar system to keep Earth habitable? Well, recognize that Earth's first life was microbial life. Microbial life can handle a lot more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And those extra greenhouse gases trap heat when the sun was a lot dimmer than it is right now. And then what we notice is we got a creator that is progressively removing life from the earth, replacing with new life, where that new life is slightly more efficient in pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets progressively brighter and brighter, our atmosphere becomes less and less efficient in its capacity to trap heat. That's one reason why life has been able to thrive on our planet for 3.8 billion years. Thanks, you. I appreciate your comments. You know, astronomers have been finding just a wealth of planets outside our solar system. And it's exciting because some of those are starting to look more and more Earth-like. But even as we find that, what we also see is that Earth's capacity to host life really makes it stand out amongst these planets. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's latest blog on this topic. It's titled, Is Kepler 1649C the Long Sought Earth Twin? It'll give you some great insight into what's going on with this planet and how well-designed Earth is to host life so that you can go take that exciting information and share about the God who created the universe to those people around you.